I am very happy to have you back here. And I just wanted to start off with uh, what is happening out in Europe with the European banks, with the Italian banks, the German banks. And do you believe the EU system, do you think it's in trouble right now? Uh, quite honestly, I think it was in trouble the day that it was born because they're trying to peg or link all of these economies together like they're, you know, Italy is not Germany. And yet Italy is required to have the same monetary policy because of the linkage. So, yeah, I, I think, you know, I think the Brexit was definitely part of the breakdown and that hasn't even been concluded yet. And they voted on that, what, a couple of years ago? And now Italy could be uh, could be next because there is a populist movement. And we saw what happened with Greece when they wanted to leave the EU. Difference between England and Italy and Greece is, you know, Italy and Greece use the euro. So they're, they have that currency. So it's a much bigger deal if they leave than if Great Britain leaves because Great Britain never adopted the uh, euro. So do you think if, uh, I know there's a bill out there now, and, and I think they're just getting, uh, the parliament has to vote on it where they're going to be leaving uh, the EU. I'm talking about the UK. Uh, do you think other countries are going to follow once this goes through? I actually do think that other countries want to follow uh, and ultimately will follow, actually. So yes, I definitely think so. I mean, we see... You know, it's this income inequality is too obvious and unemployment is in the uh, particularly in the youth unemployment, particularly in countries like Italy and Spain is not, you know, very far behind them. Uh, and there's a lot of discontent. So, yes, I do think that we're witnessing already the breakup of the EU. And I, I, and I agree with you because Christine Lagarde came out and she's head of the IMF and she warned that the EU nations need a rainy day fund to protect against an economic shock. I mean, is she projecting out there that something bad is going to hit? Well, she is. And she, and she did say that about the EU, but she also said that about the global economy, which they are talking about that the fact that we've entered a global economic slowdown because of course you have in the US uh we've already if you could call this tightening i mean it is a form of tightening uh we've already raised, been raising the interest rates and begun the runoff of the balance sheet in the EU that they haven't raised the rates yet but they're talking about beginning to run off their balance sheet the end of this year. And what that actually means is that they're not out there buying every single bond that they can. So therefore, they're not suppressing interest rates the way they were. Bank of Japan, on the other hand, thinks that they can just keep doing this forever. And, you know, I mean, heck, they've been doing it since the early 90s. So, you know, but it hasn't worked yet. So, yeah, I think we I think we're experiencing a global slowdown and I think that the danger really of the EU is that is the contagion, right? The global contagion because the banks and the whole financial system is so incestuously intertwined. So if it's a big enough Italian bank failure or, you know, Deutsche Bank is absolutely a walking zombie. Actually, a lot of the banks are walking zombies. But by admission in their very own financial statement for 2017, they are insolvent. I mean, their leverage ratio is 3.8%, which means that they've had to borrow $27 for every dollar's worth of equity. So if the equity falls in value more than 3.8%, they're insolvent. They have no equity. And they said that was, that was one part of the, of the, um, financial statement. And then shortly after they talked about the leverage ratio, they admitted that in 2017, which was a one way up market, you know, uh, that their assets fell 7%. So they're actually insolvent. A crisis happens, something that they can't cover up because uh, it's the central banks that would really want to cover that up mostly so that people were not aware of the contagion. But that's why they're allowed to survive. So, yeah, I think the Europe and that, you know, Deutsche Bank is a global universal bank. So it can start in Italy. It can start 
anywhere in the world, really, with a big enough shock to the system, it'll be transmitted globally. Very interesting. You mentioned the banks are insolvent. And I don't know if you saw the report from the biz where they said that some banks might have manipulated their books with repos and they're not as strong as we all think they are. And it feels like they're trying to separate themselves from what the banks have done because it seems like they're putting it out there that, you know, something's going to happen with the banks and we're not responsible for this. And it seems right, like they're because they want to stay in power. The, the biz wants to stay in power. Absolutely. And so does the IMF. So does the biz care about the banking system? They don't care if it crashes or anything like that. Well, they're the central banker, central bank. And between the Bank for International Settlements, the biz, and the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, they're the ones that create and monitor the global rules. But we have to keep in mind who the members of, of well, who the members of the IMF, they're all treasury secretaries and central bank chiefs in almost every single country on the planet. And then the Bank for International Settlement is owned by, what, the 60 uh, 60 of the largest central banks. So, yeah, I think they do care what happens with the banks, but it would also make a lot of sense for them to make it appear that they're trying to protect everybody else so they stay in power. But the banks couldn't have gotten away with anything if those two entities hadn't agreed to it because that's every treasury secretary and central bank chief. Uh, let me just ask you this. If the other central banks, not the biz, let's say the Fed or the IMF or uh, the ECB, they go down. Does the biz care that much that they failed in what they've been doing in those countries? Well, I actually, if they're ready for the transition, then this would be a welcome emergency, okay, or a welcome crisis. If they are not ready for the monetary and the financial transition, then I don't think it would be welcome yet. But, you know, uh, yeah, I think it's to their, I mean, at some point they need a big enough crisis so that we can accept the next bit of garbage that they want to cram down our throats. We have to accept it. They don't want us to push back. True. What do you think that the, the, the crisis is going to be? Like what, what do you think they have planned? Well, I, I'm, I'm really sure that it's going to be a derivative event. Uh, and there are so many different things that could trigger that derivative event. And derivatives, remember, are just huge leveraged bets that, um, that basically are valued at the price of the underlying. So stocks, bonds, other derivatives, real estate. And that market dwarfs anything else that we're doing. And most of that market are bets against interest rates. And most of that is off as OTC. So off, it's just a private transaction and it's, it's really not easy to view what those are. So, you know, I think that ultimately, whether it's the trade wars that we are, you know, appear to be playing between the U.S. and China, so two global powers, or, I mean, it could be the start of a war, it could be a breakup of the euro or an Italian bank going down. I mean, there's a lot of different things that are floating out there. And on top of all of that, According to the financial regulatory body attached to the Bank of England, the LIBOR, the IBORs, interbank offer rate, so that overnight uh, rate that banks charge each other, well, you know, that was corrupted, it was probably corrupted before we know, but it was corrupted according to um, recent data via Chase Bank in 2007. So before we even knew of the problem or pu the public was really aware of it. And uh, there's what, over $370 trillion worth of contracts that are written against that. And any one, it's going away completely by the end of 2021. And so they're right now having to create a benchmark, get the markets to agree to use that new benchmark. And then they have to convert all the contracts tied to the old benchmark, they have to convert them all to being tied to the new benchmark, something that has never, ever, 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 ever been done before. And, you know, it's got to come off without a hitch, which I don't think is possible.
I mean, we'll see. Time's going to say. But, uh, yeah, I think that that if if nothing else materializes in any of those other areas we're talking about, then that would be the one that I would think would uh, definitely <laughs> definitely take the system down. And at any point, it's not like you're going to wait until 2021. Any misstep along the way that gets out of control will take the system down. So, okay, you mentioned LIBOR, and we see LIBOR, that rate is continually rising. And we know that the Fed, they just raise rates again. And, I mean, we see it's taking its toll on the housing market, the auto industry, the stock market's fluctuating. Is this a repeat of 2006, 2007, when they started to raise the rates at that time? Uh, Well, you know, partly yes. But, number one, on the LIBOR or any of the IBORs that used to be supposedly a real market rate because it was what the banks would charge or pay to borrow or, or lend overnight. But that market actually collapsed. And since that's the foundation of the contracts in the world, that's actually uh, what happened was it became merely a stated rate. So they call up the bank. There are 18 banks that that create this um, that those interest rates, and the banks call up and go, "Well, no, we're not loaning or borrowing overnight from other banks. But if we were, then this is the rate that we think we would either charge or have to pay." So that's why it doesn't work anymore because it is merely a stated opinion rate. It's not a real rate. So I want to definitely clarify that because that's key. Mortgages are tied to its student loans, car loans, credit cards, and lots and lots and lots of those derivative contracts that we were tied to. The second thing that I would really like to say about the Federal Reserve raising rates is number one, when they raise those rates since 2008, not before then, but since 2008, they're raising the rates that they pay the banks to hold reserves. Not what they charge the banks, but what they actually pay the banks. So that's free money. So that's number one. Number two even though, I mean, you'll hear a mixture of both if you listen to, you know, Bloomberg or CNBC or any of those main street, mainstream kind of media places. On the one hand, they'll say, well, they're doing it because the economy is so strong. Well, we've already discussed that myth today and there's more. They state that they're doing it so that they can lower them during the next crisis to stimulate more borrowing. This is insanity. You cannot fix a too much debt problem with more debt. So, you know, they're raising them so they can lower them into the next crisis. But by raising them, as you brought out, 2006, 2007, they were raising rates, which frequently, I mean, it does. You get to the point where the rates then bring on that next recession, Though in the changes in the Dodd-Frank law, they are definitely allowing more leverage. And also in terms of, say, real estate, since we're, you know, we're talking about that a lot with rates. Right. Uh, they're also loosening the terms. So they're allows, they're allowing riskier banks to take on riskier behaviors, mostly because they just put them into a package and sell them off. So they're not really holding the risk you know, on their books. So they're in the process of deregulation, making an already extraordinarily leveraged and risky system more leveraged, more risky to both a bail in of whatever you have inside of the system, as well as a taxpayer bail out. And there's no doubt in my mind that that's coming. So you're saying that the Fed is doing this on purpose, raising the rates right now. Oh, yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, they admit it. Are they doing it for for the benefit of the people? They're doing them. I mean, they have said this. So I'm just echoing what they've said. And I believe it because I'm looking at their behavior. I mean, I always listen to what they say, but then I look at what they do. Do their actions support their words? That's what tells me whether or not I'm hearing truth. And they say they are raising them to have the ability to lower them. Well, who benefited in that last bailout rate scenario, dropping it down to zero? It wasn't the public. It wasn't Main Street. It was the banks. It was Wall Street. 
So whose benefit was that? So if they raise the rates and they cause the same problem that we had back in 2008 where everything starts to fall apart and everything does start to fall apart, will they have the ammunition to raise the rates and keep the economy going? I mean, at this point, because they're so low right now, even if they, they raise them a little bit more and then they drop them, I mean, where are we going? Negative territory? Well, yes, exactly. That's a great point. Because if you look, you can, you can see it at the Federal Reserve Fred, my very favorite re website. And you want to look at the um, rates that the uh, the Fed rates that they're charging, Federal Reserve rates that they're charging, or actually, I'm sorry, they're not cha charging, that they're paying the banks to hold it. If you go back historically, what you'll see is into every recession, they've lowered that on average. I could be off a little bit, but I'll be pretty close. About five and a half percent. Their goal is to get the rates to three and a quarter percent. Well, they've never dropped them that low. You know, the five, three and a quarter percent. The average is five and a half percent, but it's still like somewhere near five to five and three quarters. So yeah, you're exactly right. It's taking, it's, it'll take us into negative territory, which is attacking principle, which is why they want to get rid of cash. Because at this juncture, cash while it doesn't keep your purchasing power, it does preserve your principal. So yeah, we're going we're going negative. So when we go negative and they, you know, they, they're continuing, I mean, they won't do it right off the bat. They'll do it a little bit at a time until they get to the negative area. Are they going to, you know, start the printing press up? Oh, well, they they'll, they'll more do that. Currency, like QE? They will probably do that before they drop the rates or as they're dropping the rates. Because that's that's the the tools that they have are flooding the system with more money, which devalues the currency. So um, so yes, and I'm not sure that it's going to be slow. I mean, look at if you go back and again, and if you want, I can have uh, you know send you the link so you can see this for yourselves. And um, in fact, I'll do that, and you'll see that when they've dropped the rates into a recession. It's not been slow. It's been very fast because they're trying to get people to borrow and spend. Oh, look at how cheap money is. Well, money's been cheap for a really long time. And interest rates are supposed to indicate the time value of money. So what's that tell you about the time value of money? And, and plus, we're entering an era because they're raising those rates that they pay the banks, but they're having a harder time controlling the longer term rates. So we're looking at a flattening yield curve and then potentially an inverted yield curve where interest rates, short term interest rates are higher than longer term interest rates. Right. I mean, that's pretty that's a pretty dangerous, um, at least historically, that's been quite a dangerous thing. And yeah, that, we're yeah. near that right now. That normally means we're in a recession or approaching a recession. Yep. So let's I mean, the, we, we talked about interest rates. But at the same time, we know there's going to be an effect on the stock market. There's when this happens, we know that already happening. Yeah. And right. Yes, I agree. And we're also going to see problems in the job market. I mean, retail is being demolished. Right? I mean, Toys R Us. I mean, they're, the last store is going out and 33,000 people are going to be out of jobs. So yes, they can create currency. They can lower interest rates, but they can't control jobs. They can't control people spending money in retail. They can't control any of that. And that's just going to collapse, won't it? Yes. And and actually, when you said they can't control people spending, that's really what digital currency and negative rates are all about. If you read their documentation, um, you know, they talk a lot about decashing, cashless society, how that would work. And in every single report and lots of other just statements that they'll make, you know, they talk about the fact that once everything is digital, there are no limitations on how low they can push those interest rates. In other words, how rapidly they can attack your principal and inspire you to spend. Because if you've got money in a bank account and you look at it today and it's, you've got a thousand bucks in there and you look at it tomorrow and you have 900 and it's not because you spent that money. It's the negative rates eroding your principal. Well, if you can't take it out and protect your principal in cash, what are you likely to do? Spend it on anything that you think might hold its value. 
there you are. That's what hyperinflation does. You convert Which that money into something that you hope and think might hold its value because the currency does not. People did see that happening and we were in the negative territory. Again, yes, they, they would try to push people to spend, but if you don't have a job, it's going to be very difficult. But wouldn't people, if they saw the negative territory, wouldn't people then say, okay, cash is becoming worthless. It's being devalued. Wouldn't I take my funds and protect it with gold or silver or anything like that at that point? Well, you're assuming that that's still a possibility. So the answer is yes, if they could, they 100% would. But my bet is, much as we see historically, before an event like that happens, there's some kind of overt confiscation so that the public doesn't have that protection. That's why it's so important to get into position now while we still have those options, because they're for sure manipulating, the, you know, uh, look, the spot market was created in gold particularly, but in general anyway. The spot market was created to manage your perception. I mean, that, that's really why it was created. And a rising gold price is an indication of a failing fiat currency, so a failing government currency. So they have to suppress the true value of gold. But the smart money, those guys that understand it, so most of the central banks, in the world, um, not all of them. Apparently, we're not adding to our position. But, you know, China and Russia and India, all of those countries and many, many more are accumulating gold. They're manipulating the price down and then they're buying it cheap. And I'm going to tell you, not coming back on the market, especially when we go into whether it's a hyper deflation or a hyper inflation, they're basically the same thing. You know, they're just the flip side of the other coin. You know, and that's what people don't realize. But an imploding stock market or bond market or real estate market is deflationary. Prices are coming down really rapidly. There's only one way to fight that, and that's with inflation. Pushing those, those prices up in nominal terms, so in terms of dollars. But when you're doing that, the value of the dollar is declining really rapidly. And in fact... In the most current uh, statement of the value, the purchasing power value of the dollar, we broke four cents out of that original dollar. It was actually a dollar two when, when in purchasing power when the Fed took over. So, you know, yeah, that, that's, they don't want you to understand this because we get blinded by these numbers, right? Oh, look at my stocks went up. Look at how high. But if the foundation, what they're created from is going down and they just put zero on the value graph, that was a new thing, right? They just put zero on there because we're now below four cents. So when do you want to know? When you can still buy gold and silver or after you can't? I mean, right now, is it is it tough? To, I mean, I, I'm hearing different things from different people where it's very difficult to get, you know, bars of gold. Yes, the coins you still can get, but the bars of gold in, in a huge quantity, that's difficult to get right now. I mean, are you hearing that or are you hearing something different? Well, actually, the reality is it depends on the size of the portfolio. But when we're building out a large portfolio... And I would say, you know, a million dollars or more would be a large portfolio. That's going to take us a minute or two because we have to strategize no matter what it is that you're wanting. We have to strategize entry because we don't want to be the ones to move the market up so that you pay more. So everything really is a strategy. How are you moving into this market? Um, uh, to my knowledge, we're not having any trouble getting, um, anything at the moment for a minute you know sometimes junk silver there are times when some things are harder and some things are easier but hey we've been around with relationships since 95 so we typically can get things when others can't and and a lot of that is because of the relationships that we've forged over the years but but we definitely do think about how we're entering or exiting any market that's part of the strategy that we execute here now, you mentioned China and Russia, uh, they, they've been accumulating a lot of gold. 
And we know the price of gold has, has been manipulated and it's, it's very low right now. And they're also selling treasuries. I mean, Russia has been selling treasuries, buying gold. Uh, China's been selling treasuries. The question is, who, who's buying these treasuries right now that they're selling? Well, my bet would be uh, the plunge protection team or they've set something up. Actually, Ireland was um, the last time. Even though they were struggling fiscally, they were also magically buying a lot of treasuries, way more than their GDP, which doesn't make any sense. So uh, they can hide who's buying it. But my bet is, is that it would be the Federal Reserve that is behind who's buying it, whoever that might be. And they're going to keep it hidden, maybe put it into Belgium or, you know, or some somewhere in the Cayman Islands or somewhere hidden that we don't realize that it's them. But we're the ones that are trying to control the interest rates on the treasuries. So China, uh, there, there was a report that there was a leaked um, report from a think tank in China. And they're warning of an economic panic. I don't know if you heard about this. And I hadn't, but I'm going to check it out now. Yeah, they were saying there <laughs> yeah, was, make that sure you write that down. There's a, a Chinese uh, think tank and they leaked it out saying that they're warning of an economic panic. And, you know, they're warning that almost like the IMF that, you know, let's get prepared for an economic shock. They're worrying about an economic panic. I mean, do these countries, I mean, now we know that they're, you know, moving away from the dollar. They're trading in their own currencies. China has the petro yuan and they've been basically duplicating everything that we've had here in the West out in the East at this point. Do you think they realize that it's just a matter of time before the dollar system collapses and they understand that there's going to be economic panic around the world and we, we need to be ready for it? Well, you know, for one thing, you know, the system is set up to kind of, you know, hide things. So it doesn't really matter. It, it isn't just the U.S. dollar system. It is the fiat, the global fiat system that is in huge jeopardy. And when you're talking about China, particularly, it's reflected in their markets, which it, which are in bear market territory. They're in negative territory, even as they're entering their stock markets, entering the global markets, the MSCI, uh, which will you know, which they had to buy a whole bunch of shares of stock in the Chinese markets. The Chinese, there actually, there's been quite a few, a rush to, uh, to, um, issue IPOs, initial public offerings of Chinese companies here. Some of those receptions haven't been as hot or even as warm as they would have liked. So, you know, we could already be seeing this unfolding. It's just, it's just that the speed, you know, that that's the thing. When we talk about those things, we always it's always referred to as something that's going to happen in the future, even as it is already unfolding. So it, it's already unfolding. That's probably why China has been accumulating so much gold and also getting their public to be more comfortable with their using their cell phones for purchases and holding money and doing all of that, they're trying to transition from a manufacturing based uh, economy to a consumer driven economy into this mess with all of the debt that they have accumulated. You know, their growth is not real. It's all manufactured. Well, that's true globally too, though. I mean, it's all manufactured on a mountain of unpayable debt. So yeah, I think that they know this, but I, I just think that we need to think more in global terms. And, um, you know, as a, as a community, I think that we need to, you know, think about the general public all as the community, wherever they are, whether it's China or Australia or the U.S. or England or, or anywhere else, because that's how we have to come together, in my opinion. So to, to get out of this situation where the, the global debt is getting out of control, what has to happen? Can they just continue on with this and, you know, have a small little crash, then create more currency, which creates more debt, which we lower the interest rates to negative territory, you know, people lose their wealth. I mean, how much longer can they keep this going and what has to happen for this entire system to be redone? I mean, what needs to happen here? Great questions. You know, number one, I don't think any of us really saw QE, that that hyperinflationary money printing where it was then shoved into the banks 
So it really went into the stock market, all that hyperinflation went into the stock market, the bond market, the real estate market, the derivative market, the derivative market. God help us on that one. So, you know, but we've done it. I mean, the biz also came out and said that globally, and we're not talking about the unfunded liabilities like, you know, Social Security, the global pension crisis. We're now at $164 trillion without any of those promises in debt. So uh, since the crisis, I mean, what's that doubled or something like that? I mean, it's a ridiculous amount of money. So how much more can they grow? Well, all right, honestly, if the public, as long as the public maintains confidence in the central banks, in the currency, then, then at least in theory, they can keep this going. But the banks do not have confidence in each other. That's why the LIBOR is dead. They're not loaning to each other. They know they're insolvent. They're not getting paid back. And central banks also don't trust each other because at the end of the day, as we saw with, it's been a couple of years, but with the Swiss surprise and the Chinese surprise and a whole bunch of uh, monetary decouplings, that at the end of the day, these different central banks will do what's in their best interest, regardless of what they tell all of the other central banks. So they don't trust each other anymore. So where's that trust and confidence? The public. Because one thing they knew when they set this whole system up, and it is genius, evil genius perhaps, but they knew that the population marries the legal money of the state and they don't understand inflation and they cannot believe in this country, that the dollar could go away, even though it's gone away 96.11% since the Federal Reserve took over. So the fiat money, the, the government money, whether it's the dollar or the yuan or the euro or, or any of those, what everybody so needs to understand is it'll keep the name because then you think it still is something until you're Venezuela and you know the Bolivar won't buy anything. But it keeps people in there. So fiat money keeps the name, but it loses all value. Silver and gold hold value through this simply because, number one, and key in this, is that it's used globally in every single area of the economy. So whether it's manufacturing or jewelry or art or the financial system or even food or medical I mean, it's used throughout electronics. It's used throughout the economy. That's why it always holds value. Maybe in terms of that fiat money, it's more or it's less. But when they do the reset, because that's what they're going to have to do to get out of this. There is no way on God's green earth that they can take the garbage that killed the current system and seamlessly and invisibly move it into the new system without recourse there's no way there's just you know i mean God, i mean this is something that's beyond my control for sure but historically you know that is an absolutely 100 percent accurate statement and the central banks the biz the imf have been calling for a financial system reset that's why the cryptocurrencies are so significant and the blockchain technology is so significant because it is trustless. And they know this next time, no, they don't have the same firepower. They don't have the tools. Can they come up with something that we haven't thought of? Well, uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, they did in 2008. They changed a lot. They stopped playing by any of the old rules. They made up all sorts of new rules. And here we are 10 years later. So is that possible again? Well, yeah, I suppose it is possible. I mean, that's not something that's within my control. But I think I, I don't think that anybody really thinks that that's likely. And I think that's why you're getting all of these warning calls, whether it's in China or it's a global call from the IMF or it's an, an EU call from, you know, Italy and Spain you know, really doesn't matter. The system has to reset because it's just too full of garbage. And I was just looking at this this morning um, for uh, the piece that I'm going to present today, which is on changes on Trump's, um, on the uh, 
regulations around banks uh, since he's now beginning to, in earnest, dismantle Dodd-Frank. And when I went to the office of the comptroller of the currency, who quarterly runs a report on derivatives in the FDIC-insured banking system, those derivatives, while they've created tools, financial engineering, to make it look like it's smaller, it's spiking again. That scares the Hades out of me. Yeah, it should scare everyone. It, it should. It's substantially higher. Even the manipulated numbers to make it look less. Everybody should be writing that report on a quarterly basis. And even if you don't want to read the whole report, just they have great graphics in there. They have great tables in there showing you this. They have great um, graphs showing you this. Scan the graphs if you don't and the tables if you don't do anything else. But they publish it quarterly and it, it scares me to death. It scares me to death. There's so much speculation that these banks are doing, and now they're deregulating, allowing even more leverage. But they're using financial engineering to make it look like less. So next week, I'm going to be going over the results of the stress tests, which were actually created to make us feel comfortable. Not really real. You've got to look at those along with uh, the OCC reports and other things to get a better picture of what we're really dealing with. But one of the regulations that changed was in how they define a SIFI, a systemically important financial institution. So those are ones that if something happens, you have global ramifications. And uh, they raised the threshold from 50 billion, uh, don't hold me to this because I'm the data right in front of me and I'm a little tired, but I believe they, they raised the designation from 50 billion to 250 billion. So a lot of the oversight that the Federal Reserve was doing with banks, oh, okay, well, now those under 250 thousand billion are not going to be uh, really looked at nearly as much and even that was kind of iffy and <laughs> what they were looking at because they don't want them to go down and the fdic has what a, a little bit more than two cents for every dollar's worth of insured deposits bail in anyone yeah, they'll definitely. convert your deposits or your equity in your securities account into um into shares of stock in the failing institution and somehow that's fair I, I just want to go to the, the derivative part here because, you know, people keep on hearing derivatives and how bad they are. I don't know if you can explain what happens if the derivative market implodes, like so people can understand how bad this is going to be if this does happen. I'll try. <laughs> it's really complicated. So I'll do my best. You don't have to go into very, you know, specific detail, but on a broad sense, you know, what happens to the banking system? What happens well, in to a pensions broad... or things like that? Well, okay, we, we actually uh, have lived through uh, this issue two times, okay? When it kicked off in 97 with long-term capital management, where that, that's when they really started the speculative derivative trade. And, and what people really need to understand, it's about leverage. It's about putting bet upon bet upon bet using the same equity, so what happens is credit dries up. In 2008, that's what happened. It was all about those derivatives in this particular case. In, in long-term capital management, it was against government bonds that went bad in Asia and Russia. And so that threatened the global economy. But 14 Wall Street banks plus U.S. taxpayers stepped in and bailed them out. So nobody, not many people even know about that one. But they knew how risky that was. And then rather putting in protections and oversight, they went to deregulation and blocked, actually blocked the, like, the, uh, they actually blocked regulation of these bets. And it's kind of like going to Las Vegas. Think about going to Las Vegas, but you have more control over whether or not you're going to take a hit, you know, when you're sitting at, a blackjack table, we don't have any choices over there. So as long as um, the banks can can uh, have enough money to pay the fees, they can keep bad bets floating. But when that credit dries up, what happened in 2008? They, the whole market imploded. We all know that. We lived through it. 
Back then, we had less, it, our balance sheet were cleaner. So they could grow all of this debt. They could print all of this money. This time, they're doing it when we're already so over indebted and over leveraged. The question is, how much more could be done and maintain the confidence of the public? And, and that's what Italy and Greece and Brexit and the election of Trump and the Arab Spring and lots around the world is showing you this populist movement is showing you that lack of trust and that lack of confidence. So this next crisis, when that, when the liquidity dries up, you know, they can't grow more debt to create more money to put into the system to keep it propped up. It's all going to implode and they know this and confidence will go away because there's only a thin layer of confidence left that the public has in the banks, in the central banks, in the financial system. So yeah, this next one, this is huge because the leverage is that much larger and the yeah. bets are that much bigger. It, it's just crazy. Do you have a, a time frame? I don't want you to give us like a specific date, but do you have a time frame where you think that this is going to rapidly fall apart? I know it's been falling apart for a while. Oh, yeah. But, you know, I'm looking at the markets and I really thought that the reason for the tax law change and the repatriation was to give all those trillions of dollars that that the corporations could and would put back into the markets to keep it boosted. And yet what we're seeing instead is um, a breakdown in the system. So when you have the Dow giving negative signals and the bonds giving negative signals and a surge, a surge of insider selling, insiders are the boards of directors, the presidents, the CEOs, the CFOs. So these are the guys that are running the corporations and they have, I mean, there is such a huge surge. I just did something on it um, for insider trading yesterday. And I do that every week. I look at that every single week. It's in the wall street journal. Um, that tells me that we are, that we could be very, very close. That could easily happen and I can't guarantee that it will or it won't, but I could see it happening before the end of this year. If those stock markets continue to break down like they are uh, and raising interest rates are not helping that and trade war talk is not helping that. So we're I feel like we're paint. We're painted into a corner and we're at this point. We're kind of darned if you do and darned if you don't. Uh, and. Uh, and the markets are so fragile because taking on all of that debt, I mean, that was in a current, just the recent IMF report on the global debt levels and what's going on. And they said that their fear was because of the level of debt that the globe would not be able to react and respond to the next crisis. So I, I think it could happen before the end of this year, but I don't think that they have the new fiat ready technologically to shift us into it. Though I don't know that they would need to just yet because we have to feel a lot of pain in order to accept it. So that probably buys them a little more time as we're going through the crisis.